we are uh, we have two more sermons on our series here on letting God reassemble us for 2022. And our idea was, okay, if God reassembled us, what would that look like? What are the pieces that we recognize that are broken? And so I want to think about, all right, how many of you did a New Year's resolution? Nobody? Okay, a few of you, yeah. How many of you a long time ago said, I'm not doing that anymore? Yeah. <laughs> Warhand, yeah. You're just like, I can't keep them. Why make this up, right? So here's what's interesting. Uh, 2022, the most popular New Year's resolution, all right, the most popular New Year's resolution was to uh, bring about kind of happiness. I want to be happy. I want to, I want to experience joy. Part of that was because we came out of 2020 and 2021 with the COVID lockdown, and we all kind of were like, oh, my gosh, I'm so depressed. Depression rates skyrocket. Mental health crisis all over, left and right, right? And so one of the things that I thought was interesting was that the number one goal that people stated for 2022 was, I want to be happy again. I want to be happy now, let me confess to you, man, I felt that. When I read that, I went, gosh, I kind of want that, right? And I, I tell you, I, I've not had two more tougher years emotionally and mentally to just stay focused. And, and In fact, I went to the counselor about two or three months ago, and I said to him, I go, I don't even know if I know how to be happy anymore. Okay? Uh, what's that look like? And he goes, well, that's a problem. Let's talk about that, right? And so I, I give this message today saying to you, I don't have like, Hey, I'm standing on the other side of the fence like the most happy person in the world going, you all need to figure this out. I stand on this side of the fence. If you're here with me, maybe you're over there. I stand over here going, I struggle being happy. I struggle being happy. Anybody else with me? Okay, a few? Yeah, okay. Now, here's my thought, though. Right? What if happiness wasn't the goal? Because he, happiness is one of those things that, like, the minute you catch it and you get it, it's gone. Right? It's, what was this? Is that really what I want, or do I want something bigger than something like I'm chasing after? I'm gonna keep it's never attainable. And the minute you do attain it, it kind of flips out of your hand. And so you're just constantly chasing something that you can never catch. I just don't believe when I read scripture that that's how God designed life. I don't believe God said, I want to give you something you can't have. Or I want to piece something in front of you that, that you'll never be able to reach and attain. And so I want to help you think through this idea that maybe happiness isn't the goal, but maybe this idea of fulfillment. And there's a difference between I'm happy and I'm fulfilled. So I start thinking through 2022. What should be our goal? What should be happiness? In fact, there's a great danger of chasing happiness. Because C.S. Lewis writes, hey, if happiness is your goal, Christianity is not the religion for you. He goes, just go get a bottle of Jack. He said, but if truth is your goal and fulfillment, then Christianity is your religion. So let me define fill, fulfillment for you, really. Fulfillment means that I fulfilled the agreement. And so if, if we had a contract, right? The contract was I delivered 20 balloons. I fulfill that contract by delivering 20 balloons. If we have an agreement over here and she says, uh, hey, I need you to meet me at this place at this hour. Okay, I fulfill that agreement, that expectation, that predetermined expectation by being there on time and meeting her, right? Okay, so fulfillment immediately takes us another step back and says, there's a purpose. There's some kind of understanding that this will happen or this will take place or this is the purpose. Now, why is that important? Well, because on a regular basis, you and I have to encounter the biblical truth that is, is absolutely contrary to the rest of the world, that you and I were created with a purpose. In fact, this entire message series, you've heard me state something about your created intent purpose. Again, we can't have God reassemble our lives if there was no purpose to reassemble it to. And so we start with remembering that there was a purpose that we were created. We were created in the image of God to reflect the image of God, right? And so the only way to have a fulfilled life is to become whom God designed us or intended us to be. In fact, most of us live unfulfilled lives because we're not living into what God intended us to be. That's called 
sin. In fact, sin is missing the mark of what God intended you to be. God had a design, a purpose for you. When we behave contrary to what God's intention for you was, we call that sin, living contrary to God's created purpose for your life. So I'm thinking about, all right, what does it mean to have a fulfilled life? And I, I began to go, well, first of all, is your life filled? How many of you feel like your life's filled? Or how many of you go, I'm really unfulfilled? Now, there's a difference between my life's filled and I'm busy. And my life is filled in the sense of, man, I'm living in the fullness of all that God gives me. Now, there's a difference here also between happy and fulfillment. Because fulfillment also encompasses the difficult times. Right? One of the challenging things that Jesus says in John 10 is, I have come that you may have life. And in the book of Aaron, he goes, and I'm going to make it really happy for you, and I'm going to bring about good stuff, and everybody's going to get a brand new shiny red car. And then you get a car, and then you get a car. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, I've come that you may have life, and life abundantly. And in the fulfillment of life there, Jesus is saying, you're going to have the good and the bad. And I want to teach you what it means that the Heavenly Father walks with you in both the good and the bad and experience all the fulfillment of life. Now, this is a big deal because, again, you and I know people who have lost their faith because life got tough and bad, and they went, see, there's no good. I'm trying to figure out where they saw in Scripture that they should have a life that has no bad in it, right? A fulfilled life actually anticipates Bad times are coming. That's what it means to be alive. But fulfilled life seeks out the truth of God at all times. So where in Scripture do we see kind of God gives directions on how to have a fulfilled life? Which immediately you probably thought this too, book of Deuteronomy. Right? How many of you were thinking Deuteronomy? No? Deuteronomy. It gets its name because it's the fifth book in uh, the five Books of Moses, the Pentateuch, you have Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book. We call it the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And it gets this book from chapter 17, verse 18, meaning second law. Deuteronomy in Latin and Greek means second law. Second law. And so we read Deuteronomy and its name is, hey, this is the second law. Well, what do you mean it's the second law? Was well, the law given by Moses the second time before they enter the promised land? So here's Israel. Remember, we've left Egypt. We've had the parting of the sea, the Ten Commandments. We've had all these amazing moments as, as God's working the people out of Egypt. By the way, it took one day for God to get the people out of Egypt. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of the people. To change their behaviors. Simple, help them focus. Them. Yeah. yeah. All right. And so and they're, they're in uh, what we call the trans- uh, Jordan area, and they're getting ready to cross the sea, the Jordan River, right? And not tomorrow, but shortly there. And Moses stands up and he goes, let me give you and remind you of God's law one more time. When you get there, this is how you should live. And so these are the commands that Moses gives on how to live when we get there. Now, one caveat when we read this, this is the Old Testament, which means it's what covenant? The Old or the New Covenant? The Old Covenant, not the New Covenant. And it's important for us to always remember when we read the Old Testament that the covenantal pieces don't always apply. Sometimes we have to go, what are the precepts? What is the, the pieces that we can bring over, but not all of it applies? So a lot of Old Covenant theology is what messes up current Christians, all right, and current people's thinking. For instance, things go bad for you, your thought immediately is, I did something wrong. God's punishing me, right? Or is that just me? Right? I just, okay, it's just, I feel that way, right? And then I read the Old Testament, and that's the way it worked out. The covenant was, if you behave and obey me, good things happen. If you don't, bad things happen. That's Old Covenant, okay? And so anytime you're reading the Old Testament, you're always reading like, God's bringing about punishment because people wouldn't obey. God's bringing about good things because people did obey. Okay? Jesus comes along and says, we're, we're going to go New Covenant, Covenant of Grace, all right? And so we got we to gotta read Deuteronomy and go, all right, what's the precepts that we still carry over? And the precepts help us to live a fulfilled life. And so let's start with Deuteronomy 26. Right in the middle of it, if you got your e you may want to grab onto that, all right? 
And Moses is saying to the people, when you enter the promised land, <laughs> it's going to happen. When you enter, you're getting ready to take possession of the land that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Esau. All right? He promised that one day this will be your land. Your people will settle here. And so God says, when you get there, all right, take the first fruits. You know what first fruits are? It's whatever you get first. So today we would say it's the first part of your paycheck because very few of us are farming, all right? But it was the first harvest that you had, the first bit of harvest. And you take that first bit of harvest and you give it as an offering to God because God needs it, right? Does God need your offering? He can't give anything to God. Yeah, he doesn't need anything to do it. Anytime we read about an offering passage, we got to stop and go, all right, let's see why we're doing an offering. Because God doesn't need anything that we have. Why does God command an offering? Now pause. All right? You may be here today and you may be like, look, I was at a church. All they did was talk about money. And that's why I left. And I want you to know, first of all, we're not afraid to talk about money. Because our first priority is to get you out of debt. That's why we run the, the financial peace stuff. We want to help you do money right. All right? But we're not afraid to talk about money because we, we know it's one of the things that hang us up. But this sermon's not about money. This sermon is about, hey, God didn't need it. So why did he command an offering? Why did he say, bring the first fruits, all right, to the priest at the temple, the place for his name, all right, and declare that the Lord your God, I have come into the land that you swore your ancestors to give me. Why did God start by saying, hey, when you get to the land, one of the things I want you to do is give an offering, the first fruits. I have a couple ideas. Three thoughts I want to give you off of what it means to give to God first. Okay? The benefit is not for God, it's for us. Number one, the offering reminds the people that God provides and sustains. This is huge. In fact, if you only get one of the three points, grab this. God provides and sustains. God provides and sustains. God provides and sustains. There's a song we sing, we teach the little kids. And you may know this from when you were a little kid. It goes, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. And now, hey, that's something I was teaching a big, big truth that we can spend like hours talking about. That we say to kids so that they get that big, big truth that it is God sustains, creates, and goal orients everything. In fact, Thomas Aquinas, one of the founding fathers of the church, says to us, one of the greatest evidence for God is the goal orientedness of life. Or the goal directedness. Let me help you understand if atheism is true, and we're all just random molecules that took place and bump into each other and create stuff, then ask yourself, why doesn't a cabbage ever produce a carrot? Or why doesn't the peach tree ever become a cedar? Or why doesn't the cat ever have baby squirrels? Well, it's almost as if someone's goal-directing life and saying, here are the rules, the boundaries, and here's what will happen next in my goal directedness. Now, this is a big deal because the idea that God provides goals and directedness takes us back to our purpose, right? God has a plan for how we should behave. And so to have a fulfilled life, we have to go, okay, God, what's your goal for me? We are created goal directed. All life is created goal directed. What's your goal for me? And we have to discover what God's goal for us. But we know it was created in the image of God to reflect the image of God. The other piece of this is that God is the sustainer of all life. Now, this is a big deal because we teach the kids the saying he's got the whole world in his hands. You know why? So that when it feels like God doesn't, they can proclaim the truth to the way they feel. You ever have that hardened head have a conversation and the one's fighting with the other? Right? Where your heart's going like, he loves me. And your brain's like, he just left you and told you he didn't ever want to see you again. Like, clearly this isn't the one for you. But I'm okay. He doesn't care. Time to move on. Right in your head and your heart having that conversation. Some of you have never had that. Okay. Those of you that had that. I'm just kidding. All right. right? And, and we do this with God. Right? I, I don't feel like you care. I feel like you abandoned me. Where are you? And your brain's like, he's still got the whole world. In his hands. Got the whole world. In his hands. And the 
15th century and to the 18th century, there was a belief called deism that was a heresy of the church. In fact, uh, we have a Bible from one of our early founding fathers, uh, the Benjamin Franklin Bible. Right? And what he did was he went into the scripture and removed every miracle out of the scripture. And deism believes that God created and then set the world in motion and abandoned. Good luck. Again. God doesn't interact or behave or care even. And we have many people in that time frame that believe this, that God doesn't interact with the world. Here's why I find that interesting. I want to bring that in is because you and I still fight against that. In fact, you and I still fight against the idea from some of our friends that like, uh, look, God may have created. There might be a God. We call those people agnostics, right? Who they say, well, there might be a God, but he's certainly not doing stuff. He's certainly not interacting with the world. But the reminder from the first fruits of offering is that not only does God provide, but he's still sustaining. He's still interacting. He's still delivering. Well, how do we know that? Well, because, number one, the offering creates an attitude of gratitude. What are we grateful for? We're grateful for God's sustaining work. What he's done in the past, he will do again. What he's done in the past, he will do again. So we sing a song like, Come thou fount of every blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy praise. We sing that no matter what's going on. Because an attitude of gratitude all right, is thankful no matter what we're going through. And it keeps our attention on God. An attitude of gratitude is thankful no matter what we're going through. And it keeps our attention on God. Let me come back to point number two for a second. We work really hard to teach our kids to be grateful. In fact, that's one of the kind of hallmarks that I say. We work really hard to say, you say thank you. In fact, even when we go to a restaurant, just last night we were at a restaurant and Small was taking her order. When we, she first came to live with us, we hardly ever got a thank you out of her. And it drove me nuts. All right? And so she orders and then she looks at me. Why? Because we just trained this way. And then she looks at the waiter. She looks at me to make sure I'm looking. And it says, and thank you. I want her to be thankful. We want all our kids to be thankful. In fact, we joke with our kids, even if grandma burns the biscuits, you're thankful, right? And grandma burns the biscuits a lot, right? But we, we are thankful for the, the intention and the attitude and the attempt, all right? Be grateful. If dad drops you off, hey, dad didn't go there. Dad drove you there. When you get out of the car, say, thank you. We say to the kids at our horse lessons as they come, hey, when you leave, make sure you say to mom, dad, grandma, grandma, whoever dropped you off, make sure you say thankful. Thank you. Because what? They didn't come and ride. But Nick sat out in the freezing cold watching you. You need to say, thank you. What? Because we know that an attitude of gratitude changes how we behave and how we see the world. You guys know this. Because you've met grouchy grandpas, grouchy grandmas, or grouchy grandkids, right? And you're like, they're just never thankful. They never stop and go, I guess I don't deserve any of this. But it was given to me as a gift, right? Being at the Y, it's not a privilege. It's a gift that somebody's given to you with their hard-earned money. You should be grateful, right? Then the offering keeps our attention on God. Think about this. Peter, the story of Peter walking on the water. Some of you know the story, right? Jesus is cruising out on the water, getting to the guys in the boat in the middle of the storm, right? And they recognize, say, it's a ghost, and then Peter jumps up and goes, no, it's Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat, right? And he chases him down Jesus, right? Which, by the way, I never throw any rocks at Peter in a story because I'm always like, I don't even know if I would have got out of the boat. Think about it. There were a bunch of dudes in the boat. Peter's the only one who left to walk away saying, I walked on water for like three seconds. For three seconds, I was like cruising on the water, right? And so Peter's running on the water to Jesus, right? And you see Jesus like, yeah, come on. Then what happens? Why does Peter sink? Man. I love it. when you read the passage, it actually says that he saw the wind. But you can't really see the wind. So what's Peter seeing? He's seeing the big waves, right? So here's Peter cruising on the water. Jesus, Jesus, 
The wave slaps him across the face. And if Peter's like me, all of a sudden his brain goes, hey, you know, I can't walk on water. This was a pretty dumb idea, right? And here comes the next one. You see Peter like, oh. And what's it? He begins to sing. Now, God never says to you, hey, ignore the bad things that are coming. Or don't acknowledge that there's a bad situation. He just says to you, hey, when you're in the midst of a storm and the waves are smacking in the face, keep your eyes away. That's what the offering does. It keeps our focus on God. And so we have these three things, understanding then that the offering was a gift from God to help humanity live fulfilled lives. How do you want to live fulfilled? Hey, you do these three things, right? Remember that God provides and sustains, that God encourages us and invites us to be grad grateful, which changes our attitude, and then keep our attention focused on God. God is the sustainer of all things. And in that, Jesus, when he confronts the devil, and the devil, remember, he's, he's had not eat for 40 days. The devil's like, hey, take this bread, turn it into, or take this rock, turn it into bread. Jesus is like, hey, we don't live on, what's he say, bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, so we continue reading Deuteronomy 26, because I think this is one of my favorite places where we all go, huh? All right, the priest shall take the basket that you brought as an offering. He's going to take it to the altar of the Lord. And then you shall declare this phrase, and you probably have did it. Like when you clicked, most of us give online. When you clicked online giving today or somewhere this week, you probably said this phrase. Life. Yeah. How many of you did it? What? How many of you have ever said this phrase when you're giving the law for a claim? My gosh, it's commanded in the Bible. It's Old Testament, so you're probably okay. All right. So Moses says, say, say when you get there and give the offering. My father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt. He went down there to live. All right? Egypt was a, a, a great and powerful nation, but the Egyptians mistreated us. Then we cried out to the Lord our God, and he heard our cries. Now, again, the idea that you were a wandering Aramean is a funny thing to have the Lord say. Unless... God is inviting you to remember your story and his faithfulness to you, which is exactly what this means. So when you give the offering, God's saying, hey, remember that I've been good. I'll always be good. I'm the sustainer of life who delivered you over and over again. And when your story, remember, it's your story. You and I are now part of the story. When you choose to follow Jesus, your ancestors become Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Esau, all the way to the exodus out of, out of Egypt. And we remember that the Egyptians oppressed and God heard the cries and God rescued. All right, so we remember that God's goodness is the invitation from God to say, hey, remember, I was good in the past. I'll be good again. So what does it mean to be a wandering Aramean? Since none of you said that, let me help you out. All right, this refers to Jacob, all right, who was each Israelite's father or ancestor's. When Abraham left Ur, which, by the way, if you ever get the chance to name a town, that's the name that I would give it. Where are you from? Town of Ur. Ur. In fact, just make that up. Next time someone says, where'd you grow up? Go, Ur. Make sure he has a couple R's. Sound kind of piratey. All right? I just think it's a fun name. All right? He settled for a while in Haran. Remember, God says to Abraham, hey, I'm calling you out. Where are we going? Just follow me. And God begins to lead him to the promised land. Right? And so they end up in the city of Aram in Mesopotamia. There it's out of Genesis. All right? And then Abraham moved on to Canaan. But some of his relatives stayed there. And so whenever I see Jacob and Esau want a wife, they got to go back to the Aramea, all right, to get a wife. And so the calling then is to remember, all this was before we had this promised land, before we had a place we called home. The scripture actually is reminding you to remember, this is not your home. You're passing through. Even if you have a house, this place, this earth is not your home. Our ancestors were wandering Arameans on the way to where God wanted them to be. You're still a wandering Aramean, even if you have a home, even if things are going good, even if you have crops that you can bring into an offering which you don't have yet. When you get there, remember, your ancestors were this, 
and you still are wandering towards the promised land. I love Tony Mack's new song. I'm heading to, I'm wondering when I'm going to reach the promised land. And we remember the deliverance was never by the power of men, right? They didn't escape Egypt because suddenly Moses was tougher than Pharaoh. But the story is the opposite. They escaped Egypt because our God was bigger than the Egyptian gods. Always has been, always will be. Why? Because the Egyptian gods weren't even real. Right? And so God delivered. And guess what? If he did it then, he's still doing it today. Well, wait a second. I thought we said that, that maybe miracles didn't exist, that deism was true, that, that maybe God set the world in motion and abandoned. No, 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 no. Our past reminds us that God has been in working for our salvation over and over and over and over again. And if he did it in the past, guess what we can bet on? He'll do it again. So when things get bad, God's still working on the deliverance moment. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. And by the way, why is it a big deal? When I was a little kid, my dad would send me over to the church we lived next door to the church. He would send me over to the church to get something. All right. And we had one of those churches that had the old uh, water registers running all along the side. And so all the time that register would, you know, I mean, it sounded like squirrels and rhinos were running up and down the halls. Right. And so you're going into the sanctuary and right? you're like, oh my gosh, what is in here? And then we had these big giant stained glass windows that like, if the, the the clouds move past the moon, right, all of a sudden, like, shapes changed in the shirt. It was, it was scary when you were a little kid, right? And so dad would be like, hey, go get me this book. You would tell me where it was. And, and I would get a key, go over to church, triple it in. Okay. I had a rule. If I couldn't find it in three minutes, it wasn't going to be found. It didn't exist. And three minutes, when you're scared, that could be like a week, right? And then I would come back home. And the irony is that dad would be like, all right, let me go find it with you. You know, I never went to the church and was trembling hands and fearing something was going to get me when dad was with me. What? Dad was with me. Did the, what was that? The church change? The scary building? No. Registers still made the sounds. Lights still showed through the stained glass windows. Crazy things were always going on around. But dad was with me, so I was going to be okay. Listen, the presence of God, the sustaining presence of God, reminds us that in 2022, there's no need to fear. God is with us. He's still got the whole world in his hands. That book I mean. He brought us out of Egypt. That's our story. It's your story. Remember when God brought you out of Egypt? Well, you probably weren't there, but you remember because the story's been told to you over and over again. This is why remembering our scriptures, right? You're going to get there, and it's going to dictate how you behave with the foreigners and everyone around you. You're going to treat and care for everyone else. Why? Well, because God treated and cared for you when you didn't have a home. And on your way passing through, we want you to remember how to. What's our three loves we like to talk about at Faith United? Love God, love others, and self. Love God, love others, and self. And ask the question on a regular basis, what does love require of me in this situation? Right. So the way to lead a fulfilled life is trusting in your Heavenly Father and following Jesus. I, that sounds really simple. That's kind of what Jesus said. Remember, we're talking about the old law, the second law given, right? But then Jesus said, there's a new covenant. And the new covenant, Jesus said, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord to God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Love others as yourself. Well, we just trust God. Follow Jesus. God. That seems so simple, doesn't it? Because it is until it's not. So we remember that giving the first fruits, right, the offering, the commands, is really about us changing our mindset, about getting our brains in the correct place so that God can begin to work with us. It's for our benefit. We remember that God is a provider, a sustainer, that God creates an attitude of, or excuse me, giving creates an attitude of gratitude and it helps us keep our attention on God. I didn't know this story until about uh, three or four weeks ago. My mother and I were talking, and she was reminding me the literal day before my sister passed away of cancer. 
Carrie was leading a Bible school at the small church. It's a small church we grew up in. They didn't have the money to go out and get a bunch of curriculum, so you kind of made it up, and then you had your own songs that you did. And the theme song that week was, he's got the whole world in his hands. The cancer that my sister had had kind of overtaken her whole body. Three weeks before this moment, she got to ring the bell at the cancer treatment center, which meant, hey, we don't see any more in your body. We think you finally beat it with all the chemo and radiation. We were all excited. So this took us completely off guard. And so Carrie's leading the Vacation Bible School, and the theme song is he's got the whole world in his hands. And they're at the last day. And if you've ever done vacation Bible school, you know it's like an exhausting. By the time you get to the third day, the fourth day, fifth day, fifth day, you're like just praying that you still love Jesus and others, right? You're not even caring anymore. You're like, just get this done, right? And so Carrie's singing the last song, the closing song, and she stands up and sings. He's got the whole world. She can't get the rest out. The cancer has so closed her throat and lungs that she doesn't have the air. Doesn't have the air to sing it. And in a beautiful moment when the church behaves like the church, when the church behaves like the church, there's nothing better. Absolutely nothing better. When the church misbehaves, there's probably nothing worse. All right. But when the church behaves like the church, it's like I just want to stand up, cheer. Like there's Ohio State football's got nothing on the church when it behaves like the church. I just want to start running around the room, head butting, chest bumping, high fiving everybody, right? And so there's my sister and all of a sudden she can't sing. And all the kids are like kind of like and one of the gentlemen sees that she's in distress and comes up around the corner beside her. Puts his arm around Carrie and says, in his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. I thought, how beautiful is that? The legacy of my sister was in her last moments of being able to have the energy to speak. She proclaimed the truth that God is the sustainer and provider of all life. The reason we should be grateful, the reason that we can keep our attention on God, even in the last moments, that he truly does have the whole world in his hands. So let me ask you, what in 22 should shake you? What in 2022 20, should rock you? There's things coming. Why? Because God didn't say, I want you to lead a happy life. He said, I want you to lead a fulfilled life. And so as you allow God to reassemble you, part of that is allowing God to reassemble your mind and how you think. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a question before you have a chance to ask. Ready? What's your default when bad things happen? What's your default thinking? We all have. In the first service, someone said, my default thinking is, I'm going to fix this. And immediately I began to go into fix-it mode. It's interesting, we have a funeral tomorrow. We met with the gentleman that we're doing the funeral with, and he said, and sobbing about his wife's death, I just can't fix it. And I thought, here's my friend who's an engineer, and he's running into something he can't fix. And he doesn't know what to do, because that's the way his brain works when default mode, when bad things happen. Somebody else said, I begin to think worst case scenario possible. Anybody like that? All right. Some of you are like that. You ladies are much more worst case scenario possible people, right? And I mean, some of you, I just want to stop and say, that's not even practical. That can't happen, okay? Who marked off? He didn't kidnap your kid, all right? So, what's your immediate mode of operation thinking, your default when bad things happen? You see, the first fruits offering is do this whether it's been a good year or not. And we remember that God has provided in the past. He sustains. He's still going to do it. Therefore, we're going to have an attitude of gratitude. We're going to keep our focus on God no matter what waves are smacking us in the face. That is the secret to living a fulfilled life in 2022.
If you're going to love God with your heart, soul, mind, part of the mind piece is allowing God to say, think like this. Paul says, by the renewing of your heart, the transforming of our minds. I invite you to allow God to reassemble you by allowing God to transform your mind. And sing when the bad things come. That's all right, Satan. Because my God still got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the, say it with me, whole world in his hands. <clears throat>